Welcome everybody. Um, this is our Feast of Tabernacles service celebration. Um, and the Feast of Tabernacles. You know, we, we celebrate Jesus' birthday and we call it Christmas. We celebrate his death and we call it Easter. But at no stage could I find when I was preparing this, when are we going to have a day to celebrate his second coming? We know he's got the second coming's coming, but what's the day? So Sean and Trude were at our house the other morning and I said, come on, Sean, you know everything about everything. <laughs> I did say that. And I said, Sean, tell me, what, when is it? And he says, there isn't. The only thing we have is the Feast of Tabernacles. And some people will say, but why? Now, I came from a Baptist church. And I'll be honest, in the Baptist church, we never did this. Not in my church. We just didn't do it. And that was their, that was their choice. That was what they did. But when I, as, I've, as I thought about it, why shouldn't we celebrate Jesus' second coming? Why shouldn't we? And then I thought this. And this is a bit, a bit of wisdom that God gave me. Then I thought, and I was praying, I'm saying, God, why do we do this? And I felt him say, this is my master plan. Okay, give me more. This is, not, this is good, but I, I need something to hang off here. And, and then he said, this is my master plan. Read it. Understand the feast and what happens. This is what's going to happen when I come back. And I thought, okay, well, it has to be backed up in the, um, in the Bible somewhere, God. And we find it, as you'll hear me in my sermon, throughout the Bible. It tells you what's going to happen. And this is good. We look at the, um, the magnificent sukkot that um, Peter and Mandy have made. And we, and we see the semi-open roof. And yes, the, old, the, the word does tell you to look at the stars. But let me tell you this. When I think of it, I'm looking ahead in the, in towards heaven and saying, Lord, you're coming back soon. You're coming back for me and he's coming back for you. And this is a good thing. Because I've told you before and I'll tell you again, when I get to heaven, I'm going to see my mum. And I'm excited at that. And I've said it so often, I, my mum will do this. You've got well-behaved mums. My mum will come up and slap me across the head and she'll say, you shouldn't have done that, and then give me a big hug and say how much she loves me. So we look at the Feast of Tabernacles and we go deeper into it and study it more. And then we come to John 7. And the slides should bring up John 7 for me. Is that too small to read? I'm sorry if it is. And the Feast of Tabernacles is one event that's recorded where Jesus went to. And it tells you this. Jesus sent his brothers ahead of him to go to the festival. However, after his brothers had left for the festival, he went also, not publicly, but in secret. Now, let me stop there. I've heard sermons saying that Jesus didn't want to go. And they questioned why Jesus said in verse, I think, five or six, it's not my time, you go. What Jesus was saying, I'm not going the way you think I'm going. I'm going the way God's going to send me. The way you think I'm going, they're going to try and entrap me. So Jesus went in secret. Now at the festival, the Jewish leaders 
were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Not until halfway through the festival did Jesus go up to the temple courts and begin to teach. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without being taught? Don't you love that? Such learning without being taught. Oh, guys, get on your knees. Seek the word of God. Meditate on the word of God. Sit on your knees and wait there until God speaks to you and opens a word up and brings a word out to you. Anyway, that's a different sermon. The Jews were amazed and asked, how did this man get such learning without being taught? And Jesus answered, my teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teachings come from God or whether I speak of my own. Wow. That's good. That's good. I've stopped there for a purpose. Look at verse 18. Think about verse 18. Whoever speaks on their own does so to gain personal glory. Isn't that a well moment? For me, it's a well moment. Every time I grab this microphone, if I speak on my own to glorify myself, that's what I'm doing. I'm just trying to find glory myself. So the word says too that when Jesus said that, um, that when he was talking about the Holy Spirit hasn't come yet, he was saying, my glory hasn't come yet. And part of the secret is, for, for me, what I understand that meaning is that when we worship God, when we raise him up, when we lift him up and give him all the glory, then we can step into the Holy Spirit and be touched by the Holy Spirit because we're giving him all the glory, all the honour, and we want to stand and walk with Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. I've gone to page four. Hallelujah. You know, guys, it's all about being led by the Holy Spirit, being led by the Spirit. Luke 8 says this, every Christian must be a seed, a seed sowing witness for Christ. That's me rewording it. That's what we need to be, and you'll see me going to that a bit later. Ephesians 6 says this for us, that we need to put on the full armour of God, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And in, to in, 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 enhance that a bit more, it says, finally be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Put on the full armour of God so that you can take stand against the devil's plans. Remember I spoke about that last week? Standing strong in the Lord, standing there, being firm in the Lord. Hallelujah. Therefore put on the full armour of God so that the day of evil, so when the day of evil comes, isn't that good? It says when the day of evil comes. It's not if it's going to come. It's when. You know when you're sitting there and life's going really well and you're just worshipping God, hallelujah, life is good, chocolate cake, chocolate wrinkle cake every night and not getting fat. I don't know why you're laughing. Anyway, then bang, two kilos on the white scales. God, what are you doing, mate? What are you doing? It says when trouble's going to come. When trouble. Therefore, put on the full armour of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to hold and stand your ground. And after you have done everything to stand, what does he tell you to do? Stand firm. Stand firm. Hallelujah. Father God, we just pray, Lord, for the words that I speak tonight, Lord, that they're not my words, they're your words. Lord, I would pray that my mind would be so open to hear your voice, your leading. I don't want to talk earthly words, Lord. I want words from you. And Lord, what we speak about today, Lord, you and me, may each person in this house be touched. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. I sometimes think to myself, you know, as Christians, we, um, we go to church, we do all this stuff. Um, 
and we, we really do live an, un, an abnormal sort of lifestyle. We've surrendered everything to God. Um, I mean, I've got a boat and I love going fishing, but I'm here preaching because I love preaching and I want to do what God wants me to do. Um, and we don't always live a, a normal life. Because us being normal is being in Jesus. Us being normal is surrendering every part of our life to Jesus. And as I was praying about this and thinking about it, and I'm thinking that Jesus doesn't make it easy for us. He says things in the word which, which is hard, which normal people wouldn't, just wouldn't think it's normal. He says in Matthew 5, 38, he says this. You've heard it said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, when I was 16, that meant if they hit you, you hit them back. And if they were too big, you ran. But I tell you, he says, do not resist an evil person. If anyone slaps you on the right cheek, what does he tell you to do? Turn your other cheek. You're kidding, God. What are you doing talking about? And then he says this. If someone wants to sue you for your shirt, hand them over your coat. But the next one got me. If anyone forces you to walk one mile, it says, go with them too. That's certainly not normal, is it? Not in any form. But you know what, guys? When you look at the word, you study the word, you find Jesus in the word. Matthew 5 says this, But I tell you, Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. He causes the sun to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. Hallelujah. Now think about that. That sounds weird to us. But you think about the life of Jesus. He loves everybody. He came for everybody. And that's what he calls us to do. To be like him. And then we come to a verse like this. Therefore do not be anxious about anything. Saying things like, what shall you eat or what shall you drink or what shall you wear? Now, I haven't met a girl that isn't concerned about what she wears. So, he was talking to them too. <laughs> blessed are those who do, who do, blessed are those when they revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil things against you on my account. He says, rejoice and be glad for your reward is in heaven. So when they persecute you, when they persecute you, the prophets who were before you. You know when he says, rejoice and be glad for your reward is in heaven. That's the second coming. That's so good. Feast of Tabernacles. Our reward we gain when he comes back. When he calls everybody up. James puts it this way. Count it all joy, my brothers and sisters, when you meet all trials of various kinds. It's not a normal life that us Christians lead. Because we lead a life that's dedicated to, to Jesus Christ, our Lord. We're surrendered to him. We want to walk with him and we want to be like him. And then we come to these, this feast of this, Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is the seventh feast on the Jewish calendar. It's the last. It's a f and the Feast of Tab Tabernacles may help us answer a few questions in a practical way. And I'll put the seventh feast up there on the, on the screen. We have the Feast of Passover. That was fulfilled by Jesus' death. We had the Feast of Unleavened Bread. That was fulfilled by his burial. We had the Feast of First Fruits. That was fulfilled by his resurrection. We had the Feast of Wheats, Pentecost. That was fulfilled by the coming of the Holy Spirit. 
that leaves us three to come. And my advice, encouragement, would be to study those next three. Study what they did in what it meant to the Israelis, the Jews in the, in the, in the Old Testament, and then put Jesus in there, put Jesus in there and show you what he's telling you now. There's a four months break between the two, the two necks, between the old and the new. This four months gap is generally called the church age. That's the age where we are now. During this time, God is bringing salvation to the Gentiles in order to make Israel jealous so that they can eventually be saved. Romans 11:11. 11, 11. God's dealing with Israel resumes after the four, the three, four feasts which will be fulfilled by the second coming of Jesus. With these four feasts, we have the Feast of Tabernacles, the Day of Atonement, and the Feast, sorry, the feast of Trumpets, Atonement and Tabernacles. The Feast of Trumpets will be fulfilled when Jesus returns to the earth accompanied by a trumpet blast that will gather all the nations of Israel to Jesus. 1 Thessalonians 4.16 The Day of Atonement It will be fulfilled when Israel finally understands that Jesus was their long-awaited Messiah and they will mourn over their role in his death and be saved through faith. The third and final feast is what we're doing tonight. And all these feasts, as I said, will be in the, are in the Old Testament. The Feast of Tabernacles is either called the Feast of Booths, which is behind us, the Feast of Joy, or the feast of ingathering. Ingathering is when you grabbed all your grain, all your first fruits, all of it, and you took the whole lot to the temple. When Jesus comes back on his second coming, that is what he's going to do. He's going to grab all his people. You and me, all of us, we're all going to be there. I'm going to be at the front of the queue. And Sarah will be saying, behave yourself, behave yourself. Because I'm excited. I want to be there. I don't want to do anything wrong that I may lose my, uh, my salvation and definitely not my calling in God, as I spoke about last week. I don't want to lose that. I want to walk a, a straight and narrow, looking towards Jesus all the time, surrendering my life to Jesus. And I said to you last week, don't allow your minds to judge people. You're here to love them. And you're here to be the love of Christ to the world. Hallelujah. The ingathering. You know, it says that it, it says that that, um, that this Sukkot is meant to reflect to the Israel a temporary dwelling, a an, a symbol of when God looked after them when He brought them out of Egypt. That's what it says. It's temporary. This is good. We're only sojourners here on earth. That's all we are. It's temporary. We're sojourners. The word says that. The word says in, in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven. Don't think it's here, it's in heaven. My mate, one Peter, he says it like this. I beg you sojourners and pilgrims. It's temporary. And this just reflects that we're only temporary residences here. Our citizenship is in heaven. Oh, hallelujah. We're going to see Jesus. Now, as I was doing my study here, some of the things I found were cool. And I thought, well, I kind of like that. Um, there, we've got the temporary dwellings. I've done that. Um, through this period, they waved um, branches, as they've spoken about before, bought fruit, put that before Jesus. They had a, um, they went to the, the pool of, I'll probably pronounce this wrong, Shulomun, with the water. And the last one, which I thought was really cool, at, at the close of the first day of the feast, the worshippers 
would descend upon the court of women in the temple where four large candelabras about 75 foot tall each with four golden bowls had been set up four youth of priestly descent it'd always be the young ones you send up wouldn't send an old bloke like me i'd fall off four youth of priestly descent would climb up the ladder and fill the bowls with oil and then they would light them and the whole and the temple was on the hill of jerusalem and the light would illuminate the whole city i thought that's cool i'd like to see that but where's jesus see in the world there's always jesus don't ever miss jesus in the word john records the account of jesus at the feast of tabernacles And the, and the word also has a clear record of these two feasts that I just told you, two celebrations. But let's go to John 7, 37 and 38. Let me read this to you, because this is really important for us. On the last and great day of the festival, Jesus stood and said in a loud voice, let anybody who is thirsty come to me and drink. That's the water one I mentioned. Whoever believes in me, as scripture has says, rivers of living water will flow from them. See, don't miss this point. The festival was great. I'm sure Jesus had a great time. But at the end of the festival, he made a very clear line in the sand. In those words, he hopped up and some will say a firm voice, a loud voice, any kind of loud voice. He said, let anybody who is thirsty, he's telling them, this is a new way. I'm the new way. Come and follow me. It's not saying you should ignore, ignore this, but put me there. This is where, where you're going. Hallelujah. In John 8, he puts it this way. Jesus spoke and again, he said to the people, this is the part with the candelabras. I am the light to the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Amen. Hallelujah. See, there's Jesus in the, in the old. We see Jesus in the new. I think that's good. Now, I know you're all busting to eat. But I've, mate, I've got so many Old Testament notes here, I should just go over them all for you. Let's, let's flick quickly, so I don't want you to miss a couple of important points. There's quite a few references that I can go back and forth on, but let's go to Amos 9, 11 to 12, if, if you're taking notes. And I'm reading from the English Standard. It says this, In that day I will rise up a booth, shelter of David. Is it good? that is fallen and, and repaired and disrepair. It, and I'm sorry, on the, in that day I'll rise up the booth, shelter of David, that has fallen and repair its breaches, its broken walls. And rise up its ruins and rebuild it as it in the days of old. And all the nations who are called by my name declares the Lord. It's telling us that he's coming back. This will fall into disrepair because it's temporary. It's meant to be temporary. But he is coming back. And this is where we look. This is where we look through the roof. The prophet Isaiah says this. Well, hold on, just read first. At his second coming, remember that the Feast of Trumpets pictures the return of Jesus to the earth, accompanied by a large shout and Peter. A large shout and a trumpet blast. Woo. Following that, the Day of Atonement pitches a time of tribulation for Israel, during which many will recognise Jesus as the Messiah and be saved. The word says that. It's clear, isn't it, for us? We can go to, I won't read this because for time we're going to kill ourselves. Um, Isaiah 4, 2 to 6. 
Um, Zechariah chapters 12 and 13. Zechariah 14 describes how all the nations on earth will come up against Jerusalem. But Jesus will return, second coming, with his army and completely defeat all those nations. Amen. Amen. Zechariah 14 says this, on, the, on that day, living waters will flow out of Jerusalem, half of it to the east, to the Dead Sea, and half of it to the west, to the Mediterranean Sea in summer and in winter and the Lord will be king over the whole earth and on that day there will be one Lord and his name will be the only name that is coming guys remember Jesus claims about the living waters that he made while attending the feast of booths tabernacles here we see the final fulfillment of the words as the living waters flow from Jerusalem Let's move forward to make sure I'm not speaking out of turn. I'm not making things up. Revelations 20. Let's go to the end. Then I saw thrones and seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also, I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. And those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received the mark on their forehead or on their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is coming. This is his second coming. The Bible makes it clear for us. But we're in the age, the church age, right now. And yes, you have no obligation to celebrate any Jewish feast. Absolutely none. You don't. You won't find any telling by telling you you have to do it. But for me, I love Easter, I love Christmas, and I don't mind doing this. Because it helps me focus on who, where my Jesus is. You won't find any reference in the Bible that you have to put Christmas lights up. I had someone tell me last year, and they were telling me how... how, how um, I can I say who was? Um, how bad I was for putting Christmas lights up. And they did give me a five, ten minute little lecture about how bad I was. And I let them go. And I said, well, you're kind of speaking out of turn. Firstly, I didn't put them up. Sarah did. <laughs> Try thinking, I got him there. And I said, have you been around to see my Christmas lights? Because I did buy one, about this big, about that big. Goes in the window, doesn't it? Front window. Guess what it says? Jesus is Lord. So you're saying my, my sign's bad. He goes, oh, I'm talking about all the others. And I said, mate, don't judge. Don't, why would you waste two seconds of your brain judging that? You know, it's, you remember a sermon I gave a few weeks ago, and, or probably a couple months ago, where I said, don't take on the offence? Be like Jesus. You don't have to wear the offence. Our job is to love and, and nurture and care for people. Totally off track. Revelations 21 says, and there should be a PowerPoint for that. And I heard a loud, loud voice from the throne saying, look. God's dwelling place is now amongst the people. Amen. And he will dwell with them and they will be his people and the God himself will be with them and be their God. Amen. This is the second coming. That dwelling place will not be temporary any longer. It will be eternal. That's what the word says. So for me, This time helps me focus on who I remember who God is. My God is faithful. His faith been faithful to me in the past. He's faithful to me in the current. And he's faithful for you in the current. As you push in, lean on him. Allow him to, to hold you, to walk you. Give him all your hurt, your loneliness, your disappointments.
and is faithful for me in the future. I rejoice in who I know God is and his goodness. I rejoice now and in the future because I know there's only good to come. I know there'll be bumps in the road and the devil will give me bumps and things will go and I smile and go, whatever. My God is good. He is good. So do your best, mate, because my God's good. And guess what? I know who wins. I know who wins. But the word says, be, put your full armour of God on and stand firm. Don't be ignorant of what's going to happen. Keep your prayer times right up, seeking him so God can speak to you before some of the times these things happen. It is, it is good. I remember going into a meeting. Um, I went into a church meeting and I was going to be sacked that day. Unbelievable. Who'd want to sack me? <laughs> Why would I want to do that? Anyway, a friend of mine, um, he rang me. He rang me and it was about six in the morning. And I, had, I knew they were all coming across interstate to come and see me. I thought I was a good bloke. Um, and a friend of mine rang me about six and said, Peter, and he speaks very abruptly, he says, Peter, God's spoken to me about you this morning in my quiet time. I don't know what time he got up. I'm sure God wasn't up before six. Anyway, he said, God's spoken to me. I've got to come and see you. I said, well, I'm free this afternoon. No, no, good enough. I'm coming now. That's what he did. I said, went in there and I said, sir, he's coming across and seeing me. Do you reckon it's fair dinkum? So I quickly got dressed. Before I was dressed, he was there. He was. And he, and he, he came into my front room and he said, okay, sit down. This is what God's told me. Now, he had no idea what was happening because I hadn't shared it with anybody, except says. He had no idea. And he listed out what was going to happen. And then when he finished, there for about probably five, ten minutes, he said, I'm off now, I've got to go to work. I went to that meeting and he was right. But God had prepared my heart, given me wisdom, so I was fully armoured up. Our prayer life is so important to be on our knees praying, seeking God, seeking his wisdom for, for, for you, your children, your grandchildren, praying, interceding, blocking the devil, saying, no, you're not touching my grandchildren and stand against it. Hallelujah. Oh, don't you love that? I love that. I want to finish with this. Revelations 21, 3. And I, heard, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, look people, look to heaven. Turn your mind and your spirit into the spiritual realm and look into heaven. Look, God's dwelling place is amongst his people and he will dwell with them and they will be his people. Amen. Amen. This dwelling place will not be temporary. It will be eternal for you and me. Jesus will be there forever with us. The Feast of Tabernacles is, is just a reflection of looking forward towards the second coming. We will be his people and he will be our God. And we will worship our Lord and we will give him all the glory forever and ever. You know, the glory of the Lord is just to get on your knees in your quiet time. Get everything out of your mind. And as your knees are starting to hurt, just hold your hands up and say, Lord, you got all the glory. I give you all the glory. And as your knees are hurting, say it again, Lord, I give you all the glory. I give you all the glory. And I'm telling you, as you hear the devil's going to give you your past hurts, your past disappointments, past losses, and you say, Lord, I give you the glory. 
Lord, I give you the glory. You know, my mum committed suicide. But I will say, Lord, I give you all the glory. Because the devil, you thought you won, but I'm going to see her in heaven. You stole her from me for 40, 50 years, but I'm going to see my mum in heaven and be with her forever. Lord, you've got all the glory. Nothing in your life can, can be damaged because the Lord's got the glory. I give it to Jesus. I give everything to Jesus. Everything to Jesus. We're going to finish with a song. And these are the words of this song. It says this, Open the floodgates of heaven. Let the Lord's rain fall upon you. Let his spirit come upon you. Hold your hands out, people. You know, we used to be a thing that used to call um, inner healing in the 90s. Was it 90s, Russell? About 90s, something. And you know all it was? is holding your hands out and saying, Lord, allow your Holy Spirit to fall upon me and to cleanse me and wash me and clean of the hurt. Hallelujah. Open the floodgates of heaven. And as we, we go into that song, if you feel comfortable, stand up, hold your hands out and give everything to the Lord. Just in a sec, guys. All that hurt, all that past disappointments, give everything to the Lord. Open the floodgates of heaven, let the rain, let it rain, let it rain. The Lord reigns and let the earth be glad. Let the distant shores rejoice. Clouds, thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice will be the foundation of his throne. A fire goes before him and consumes his foes on every side. His lightning lights up the world and the earth sees and trembles. The melt mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness and all the people see his glory. We want to see your glory, Lord. So let it rain, Lord. Let it rain.